The trial is barely a week old and already living up to its dramatic billing. Sheridan Sachs' renowned QC Maggie Scott and once again decides to represent himself. I have a statement to read on behalf of my client Thomas Sheridan. I can confirm that Thomas Sheridan today would do instructions from counsel and will be representing himself. Mr Sheridan over the course of the last three years has probably had the finest legal minds at his service from Donald Finley to Maggie Scott um, and they contributed a great deal to this case. But in the end, nobody knew the case inside out like Tommy Sheridan. Nobody knew the politics. Nobody knew the questions that he wanted to be asked. Sheridan promptly demands a recall of all the witnesses from the first week. Many of the allegations faced by Sheridan rest on a meeting that took place at a cramped Glasgow office in 2002. It was an emergency meeting of the SSP National Executive, hastily convened after the News of the World published its story about the unnamed swinger MSP. This meeting would prove pivotal. Sixteen of those present give evidence in court against him. This is their account of what happened that night. It was the most difficult, traumatic meeting that I had ever been at in all my years of political activity. And I remember thinking I was glad he was there because we, you know, I'd persuaded him to come and I was glad that he came. He'd done the right thing, that was good. And I was going to support him through this as much as I could. He had a pad on his lap, which he never lost contact with. Um, and he um, said that he had been reckless, um, a silly boy. And the story in the News of the World, the Advercan story in the News of the World, um, was about him. He had attended Cupid's. People were visibly upset um, and shocked in their faces and everything and he was quite almost casual. He'd been there twice, he said, once before he was married, once after he was married. He got it out of his system and it was probably a stupid thing to do he got it out of his system. Went with other people, they were water tight. Absolutely tight. Um, he said, Anne Vercan, he was confident Anne Vercan wouldn't name him either, but um, if she did, he would destroy her. They hadn't identified an MSP, he was confident they couldn't identify him, and then the nature of these clubs, the people who went there didn't talk about it. So he felt that the newspaper would never be able to prove he was there, therefore, if they tried to write in else, he would sue them. He wanted the support of the SSP to pursue defamation if necessary to protect his reputation because he was sure that um, there wasn't any proof. By that time now, I'm looking around the room and trying to make eye contact with people. And Kevin McVeigh's crying. Um, Richie Venton's sniffing. These are, these are powerhouse men to me and they're falling apart right about me. The SSP didn't want to be dragged into a very public battle with the news of the world which they saw as the enemy of socialism. But Sheridan insisted on calling the paper's bluff. He thought the tabloid would settle before it got to court. Tommy said there was no proof, there are no pictures, if there's any photographs. He said, but there aren't any. He said, so therefore, um, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to fight this. I'll take the news of the world. Imagine, and he started becoming Tommy the speaker again. Imagine. Eyes against the news of the world, Murdoch's press, rrr, you know, and it, it, the kind of fire came back, yeah. And I think we were then supposed to do what we'd always done and go, yay, you know, yeah, we'll do that, let's do it. But we were all just going, no. One by one, Sheridan's former comrades troop into court. There are bad tempered exchanges across the courtroom, often requiring intervention by the judge. Scotland's socialist movement was publicly tearing itself apart. One such exchange with former comrade Alan Coombs went like this. You're a liar, Tommy. A pathological liar. Tommy, this is just character assassination. Sheridan replied, that is what you are doing to me. To which Alan Coombs retorted, I've come here to tell the truth, facts and reality. J.K. Rowling could not have made up the kind of stories that you have made up. Sheridan accuses his former colleagues of lying 
and been part of a conspiracy against him. They will get together, they'll decide their line, they'll stick to their line, and they will inflict as much damage as possible. How do you account for the 15 or so people at the SSP National Executive on the 9th of November 2002 saying that you admitted attending Cupid's? How do you account for that? I think that's awful easy, Mark. Um, big fallouts lead to bitterness, and bitterness can lead to lies and deceit. And what you've had over the course of the two trials, 2006 and 2010, as I tried to explain in 2006, is you've got a complexity whereby a political war, a civil war within a political party, was getting fought out in a courtroom. And when you're involved in a political civil war, people will do and say things which, quite frankly, are not true. If 16 people were certain Sheridan admitted going to a swingers club, there were four who were adamant he denied it. One of them is Jock Penman. At the meeting then, so what did he say as far as you remember? He said that the description of this MSP was totally different to him. He said that he, uh, the guy went to swingers clubs, he'd never been to a swingers club. Uh, the guy got drunk, he took cocaine, he says, you know I don't drink, you know I don't take drugs. And then uh, he finished off uh, saying, uh, you, know that, you know that that's not me. Um, and uh, then he attacked uh, the News of the World, their record. He said uh, they've been after him for years. Um, that they've been dying to get a story on him, but they haven't got it. And he said, that's, and this isn't it. So he left it at that. Sheridan's claim that factions in the party were out to get him is backed up by Jock Penman's evidence to the court. It was getting personal and they were going back 20 years, you know, you've always been, you know, you've always been selfish and, you know, stuff like this, you know, and I had felt that it was like I was an outsider, you know, it was like a family uh, fallout, you know, um, that's how it appeared to me, you know, because, I mean, they were saying things to each other, you know, that only either the bitterest of enemies or the closest of friends would say to each other, you know what I mean? Jock Penman's account of that meeting is diametrically opposed to what the court heard in the first weeks of the trial. On the evidence that you gave in court, you say that Tommy denied ever having gone to the swingers club, but there are 15 committee members who are at that meeting who say that your version of events is wrong. Are you concerned about that? Are you concerned about repercussions at the end of this trial, no matter what the verdict is? Well, yes, of course I am. Of course I am. But uh, it's either I either accept these repercussions, if there are any, or uh, tell a lie and say, I, I don't remember what Tommy said, or I say, I know they, they're right and I'm wrong. You know, but I would be lying. Tommy Sheridan would know I was lying. And worse than that, I would know I was lying. Have you committed perjury? No, I haven't. Are you telling the truth? Yes, I am. What happened at the SSP meeting that night is critical to Sheridan's perjury case. Did he confess or not? Police found evidence that suggested he had. Now, during the trial, you had evidence from Rosemary Byrne, Jock Payman and Graham McIver and Pat Smith to the effect that he did not admit visiting Cupid's. Now, are these the only four people other than yourself who are telling the truth about the meeting of the 9th of November 2004? Yes. We traced and obtained statements from a number of people who have told us that Rosemary Byrne, Jock Penman, Graham McIver and Pat Smith spoke to them individually and at branch meetings after the meeting of the 9th and told them that you had admitted their visit to the Cupid's. Do you have any comment to make? Um, people suggesting that, I think, must be lying. Um, but it does confirm the uh, point I made earlier about the agenda that you've been pursuing. At the end of this chapter of evidence, four times as many witnesses say that Sheridan admitted going to Cupid's. The men and women of the jury are asked to decide who to believe. They are also asked to work out whether the by now infamous visit to Cupid's sex club in Manchester ever took place. The court hears from the two women, Catherine Troll and Anne Verkan, who say they accompanied Sheridan that night. Catherine Troll said she'd had an affair with Sheridan while he was married, something which she described to the BBC in 2006. I think it was just a thrill because he was who he was, and yes, he can be quite charming, charismatic of... I think for me it was just because, you know, he he was the leader of the SSP and um, 
um, he kind of had a, a name for himself. Morning. Obviously, I think he's a hypocrite and a liar. Um, and I can't believe he took this to court because I would never have said a word about this to anyone um, and neither would any of the other uh, SSP members, no matter what newspapers would have written, I would have denied it, as I did in the first instance, because uh, to protect myself, to protect Tommy, to protect everyone around me, um, it's not the sort of thing you want out uh, on front pages. Catherine Troll stands by her story in the latest trial, insisting that she did go to Cupid's. The News of the World sex columnist Anvar Khan corroborates Catherine Troll's account of the sex club visit. It was Anvar Khan's sex story which set off the Sheridan scandal. But in the witness box, she's forced to admit a series of details in that original story were made up. The fourth swinger in the party is one of Sheridan's oldest friends, Gary Clark. Until the trial, he had always maintained he had no recollection of visiting Cupid's. In an unexpected turn of events, the former footballer changes his story, comes to court and admits to being one of the five, along with Sheridan, who visited Cupid's that night. Gary Clark, uh, I mean, his evidence in court I think was quite pathetic. Because on the one hand he says he's going to remember something, and on the other hand he says, yeah, he was comatose. People who are comatose can't remember things. Two other people, including this man, claim they met Sheridan at Cupid's that night. The last of the alleged swingers is Tommy Sheridan's brother-in-law, Andy McFarlane. He was never called at the defamation action, but is dramatically introduced by Sheridan. Andy McFarlane said that not only had he never been to a swingers club in his life, but that he had never even met either Anvar Khan or Katrine Troll. Have you ever been to a swingers club? I've never been to a swingers club in my life. I've told a jury that in 2006. I'll tell a jury that again in 2010. And I think when the evidence begins to unravel as far as these people are concerned, they will see that there is a difference between allegations and fact and truth. Six weeks into the trial and things are not looking good for Sheridan. He's exhausted, is granted some sick leave and goes into hospital for heart tests. The fact that he managed to last it out so long is testimony to his, his own physical and his mental strength. Um, but in the end, we had to step in and the court had to be advised that this is not possible. Um, it may well have been his decision to dispense with counsel, um, but that doesn't mean that he shouldn't be given the opportunities to prepare and to take rest. Then, on day 32, events take a dramatic turn for the prosecution case. One of the charges against Sheridan involves lying under oath about his involvement in a sex party at the Moat House Hotel in Glasgow. He denied it ever happened. His wife offered an alibi. Gail Sheridan told the defamation case in 2006 that she was with Tommy that night and he therefore could not have been at the moat house. But during police questioning, it was put to her that she had in fact that evening been phoning around trying to track him down. The night before Andy's wedding, Keith and I were Gary in Gary's and Debbie's house, that being Gary Clark and Deborah Clark. And when we got home, my daughter Leanne said that Gail Sheridan had telephoned our house looking for Tommy. So you're in his company, but you're going and looking for him. If you believe the evidence that you gave in court, under oath or affirmation. Which you were adamant about. Why were you looking for him? 